Hi, this is your host Apin Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us once again, Thomas Graf, co-creator of Cilium Project and co-founder of Isovalent. Thomas, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks all for having me. It's great to be here. It's my pleasure. Today, we are mostly going to talk about the new report that you both came out with. But before we go there, let's quickly remind our viewers what is Cilium all about and what is its role in the cloud radio space. Cilium is a CNCF project is best known to be what's called a CNI, a container networking interface plugin, which provides the networking portion of um, Kubernetes. But we're by now actually much more than just a CNI. We're doing load balancing, we're doing network policy, we're doing security, we're doing runtime security, we're doing service mesh. So we've quickly grown into a a, a platform, um, kind of a, an ecosystem b- based on eBPF-based tooling that provides a variety of different values around networking, security, and observability for cloud-native infrastructure. Talk a bit about the role Cilium as well as Isovalent is playing in the space to kind of lower the barrier of entry, make things, because also uh, as you're talking about observability, security, monitoring, these are all, there is also a lot of projects within CNCF, uh, they offer that. So so talk a bit about the, the overall picture there. Yeah, so I think there's two aspects that matter. First of all, of course, we're not the first projects to provide networking, connectivity, observability, security, and all of that. I think what when we created Silim itself, it was clear that there is a new team forming, a new a new set of uh, persona forming that will use Kubernetes containers and so on. Back then, it didn't have a name. Now it seems to be getting a name called platform platform engineering. So everything we build is built for this persona. And then the second aspect that is unique about Cilium is the use of eBPF. So the lower level magical technology that we use to implement all of this is this eBPF engine kernel level technology that allows us to do things better, faster, and more efficient. So that these two components really is what makes Cilium or the entire Cilium ecosystem unique and, di- and essentially dif- differentiates to other, to other um, projects. Yes, and let's start with the users. Now talk a bit about how, what kind of users growth you have seen over the years. Yeah, I think it's, we've seen amazing user growth from a perspective that I would say we have not expected even, even, even close. Um, when we started out seven years ago, we started out with a team of three. Uh, three, three engineers working on Cilium and writing code. By now, we have over 500 code contributions from different from from different people. And that's only just counting the people who have actually contributed code. Um, we have end user organizations that have added themselves um, to what we call a Cilium users file. Um, we have over over 14,000 users in Slack chatting about Cilium and eBPF and how they solve networking security challenges and so on. Uh, we have grown the, the, the our, our Twitter follower base and so on. So on every, met, on, on every metric, and you can see this in the actual report, we have essentially grown massively beyond every expectation we had. As you were talking, you know, the, the initially the project, you know, most cases projects start with a specific focus, with the user, uh, the scope of the project grows. Talk a bit about some of the exciting use cases or users that you have seen and you, like initial days, seven or eight years ago, you would not, hey, no, they will not be, I mean, this is not our use case. Talk about if anything is there that excites you also. Yeah, this is, to me, this is, I've been building products and projects for a long while, and this is always the most exciting part because you're often wrong. I remember, obviously, we started out as we're going to be the networking layer. So we provided multi-node networking that containers and pods can talk to each other. And that was clearly also an element, well, this is cloud native, these are microservices, so layer seven matters. Like, you just don't want to stop purely on on the network level, but we need to do layer seven firewalling, we want to do layer seven load balancing and so on. But then the layer seven firewalling initially was actually not interesting at all to users at all. They wanted observability, they told us. Stop with this next gen firewall. We really want to see what's going on first. So we have to build Hubble first. An observability layer that gives uh, platform teams and application teams deep insights. What are my apps doing? How is the, net- how is the network um, happening? Or how- is the issue on the network side or is it the app side? And then I think the wave of DNS issues appeared. So all the platform teams wanted to have dashboards on how is DNS doing? Is DNS the issue? So we literally have a dashboard that is answering the question, is DNS the cause of the issue? And then there is also interesting aspects where we thought that we would properly predict um, kind of the market when we built multi-cluster connectivity, multi-cluster um, low, multi-cluster load, load balancing. And I remember doing a KubeCon talk back in 2018, and it was not really interesting at all yet. 
people said, yeah, that's cool, but nobody started using it. And now today it is our most frequently used feature. Um, and if I would, I think, list one feature, one aspect that we would have never guessed we would actually cover, it is clearly Service Mesh. I think uh, when Service Mesh came around, it was like, yes, that Service Mesh will run on top of Stellium. Clearly, there is uh, a, a little bit of overlap. We're targeting the same um, team. I think there is a bit of connectivity overlap, but we're over at, well, we're kind of operating at different levels. And now we've naturally grown into covering service mesh as well. That's definitely something that we did not think about when we initially started, uh, started Cilium seven, seven years ago. This is an open source project. So folks can, of course, see uh, the, how does the pipeline look like. But if I ask you, what are the things, you know, that uh, was again, as you, you said initially, and then you, you you, you kind of grew the scope of the project. So talk a bit about what kind of things we should look at for in 2023 uh, in terms of Cilium that, hey, these are the things that you're working on. These are problems that we are trying to solve uh, for the user community. I think there's three main areas that we really, really focus on. Uh, first of all is clearly Tetragon, which we announced last year. Runtime security using eBPF in the in the in the in the Stellium ecosystem. So all the eBPF knowledge that we have that we've applied to networking, we have brought into uh, into Tetragon to solve runtime security from an observability and enforcement perspective. We've announced that at KubeCon Europe last year. Uh, we've now have prod users and we're kind of iterating. There's definitely a lot to come in 2023. Um, the second aspect, we're very excited for what is coming with Gateway API on the service mesh side. Um, we've added ingress support to Cilium and uh, just in 1.13 that is coming out in a couple of days, um, supported the first version of Gateway API and we're looking forward to uh, essentially continue with the upstream community to work on Gateway API to essentially standardize the intent language, the API, how to configure a service mesh. I think that will empower Cilium to become um, a fully capable service mesh. Uh, and I'm really looking forward for an industry-wide standard on the service mesh side. And the third part, I think, is definitely um, listening to our users on the on-prem networking side, all the enterprises out there trying to figure out how to connect their existing infrastructure with this new cloud-native world, providing the answer to that. That's the third uh, big focus that, that we have. And that uh, kind of makes me think of that. Um can you also talk a bit about, as you're talking earlier about the the, the adoption of Kubernetes, uh, which is growing? Also, you talk about some of the pain points. What are some of the core pain points that you are seeing, uh, not just as a co-creator of Cilium, but also uh, co-founder of Isovalent, that the the wider you know ecosystem, you know, users are feeling there, and you're like, hey, this this is still some of the challenges that the whole cloud audio community has to still solve. So I think in the beginning it was very basic. Uh, problems like even just getting the baseline securities in place or migration to, Kuber, uh, migration to um, Kubernetes essentially resulted in teams losing all of the observability because the existing observability solutions would not have visibility into a, into a, um, um, into a cloud native cluster. Now today, the challenges are a bit more nuanced and we see enterprises struggling with I want to migrate more workloads from my on-prem settings into the cloud, but I cannot do I cannot do so for all of my apps. I can only, for example, the stateless portions or parts of the apps, but some of the databases need to, stay be, um, need, need to stay behind. But then that's actually very challenging for enterprise applications that no longer want to be modified. So providing them solutions how they can partially migrate while, for example, preserving the, the, the actual network addressing and so on. There's a lot of many asks there to help migration into the cloud because it's, it's very desirable. But it's not easy. It's not as easy. It's very simple for, let's say, the cloud natives that have built their apps in the cloud and have a CI/CD pipeline. It's it's dramatically more complex for um, enterprises that uh, are not in a position that they can just simply rewrite all of their apps. Now let's talk about this report. Uh, talk a bit about the idea behind the report, how frequent it comes out, and what was the methodology that was used for this one? Yes, yeah, so I think from the very beginning, Cilium has been very community focused. When we look at what features we have built, we have always been asking our community, what are you using today? What are What is blocking you from using Cilium more? What would you like to see in the future? So we've always been interacting with the community um, of, of um, Cilium. And same here in the report. The report really focuses on how the community sees Cilium. How many people are using Cilium? Which features are being used? Um, how many um, contrib contributors we have, how many different companies are um, working on Cilium and so on. So it's the report really goes into detail 
how psyllium stands in the ecosystem all right, and how we have evolved solving um, different use cases for different users. Out of these you know, findings, which were the ones that you saw were, hey, we were not expecting that, or it's like, hey, this is a trend that you're expecting, and it's good to see that, that it's going in the right direction, or you're like, hey, no, that's not what we're expecting. Anything that caught your attention? Yeah, I think the two, two aspects. Aspect number one is that the rise of Kubernetes outside of the cloud is going much faster than ever anticipated. I think we've seen like very cloud-focused use of Kubernetes and cloud native in general. And if we look at Cilium usage now, and I would say like more than 90% of Cilium usage in the beginning was cloud only. And now 70% is including at least an on-prem aspect. And a lot of the focus is actually, how do I connect my infrastructure that's not in the cloud yet? How do I connect that with my cloud native workloads? And Cilium is essentially starting to cover that aspect as well very, very quickly. And the second aspect is definitely how quickly we have um, gained a foothold on the service mesh side from essentially running an initial survey. Hey, we have been hearing that you would like us to cover service mesh without sidecars. Tell us how you want that to a better program to production users in one, in one year. That was definitely completely unexpected, um, but obviously a very um, pleasant, a very pleasant surprise. How is this report going to help the project? Because as you're talking about, you know, to gather a lot of insights from the users, how they're using it, other communities that are there. Because when we talk about community, there is no community. There are communities. There are community of maintainers. There are community of users. There are like pure vendors. So talk a bit about uh, some of the learnings or findings of this project that is going to, oh, sorry, some of the findings from this report that is going to influence the project and which, 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 which ones are those? So I think out of such reports, and in the end, open source projects at this stage is always like a massive, massive effort by a lot of different people. And in the, in the beginning, that's a, say a, a core team and you talk to each other very, very frequently and everybody knows each other. At this point, it's literally hundreds of people coming together and creating Cilium. So I think a big portion of this report is actually to thank the people, right? To actually list the contributors that are on a daily basis, reviewing code, writing code, bringing in ideas, testing code, like keeping the CI running, all of that. And also I think shout out and essentially highlighting the companies the vendors that are funding these engineers and actually help Cilium get along. So to a large extent, I think we are also doing this, 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 this report to essentially list out like who is actually contributing to Cilium, who is building Cilium, to make sure that the people and the companies that are actually doing the contributions see that they're being recognized. And this will, of course, help uh, that the effort continues and that uh, vendors and, uh, and, in, and individual, individual engineers continue to feel comfortable and continue to, be, to con continue to feel motivated to actually work for Cilium and continue uh, implementing what our, user, our users are asking us to do. Thomas, thank you so much for taking time out today and not only talk about Cilium as well in this report and with the larger you know, challenges for the whole community, but also how you folks are solving it. And um, it was a great discussion. As usual, I look forward to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the time. Thank you.